Right, good morning, everybody. Can you, can you hear me? Okay, so let me just start by saying that, um, that I'm sorry to be giving this keynote now because I was so looking forward to uh, introducing Neil, whose contribution to the whole revival of the idea of uneven and combined development has been so uh, indispensable, and culminating, of course, in this conference itself. So I wanted to start by thanking him. Th this revival um, has been underway now for nearly 25 years. And during that time, it has been applied uneven and combined development, to more and more topics in more and more disciplines. And I think that that demonstrates the, the, the potential, the intellectual potential of Trotsky's idea is on a par with other major intellectual innovations like world systems analysis, post-colonial theory, and so on, which have turned out to have radical implications across the social sciences uh, and humanities. And I think that makes it remarkable that we've never had a big interdisciplinary conference like this uh, before that would enable us to take stock of how this research program is taking shape and which also galvanizes us for the next stage in the development in the, uh, of the idea. So I think you know, so much of this is down to Neil um, and um, you know, even though he's not here, I, you know, I want at this point to just voice my thanks to him for taking the leading role in, in organizing this, this conference. Okay, can everybody hear me so far? Yeah, great. Okay. So this revival of, of UCD has been criticized, actually, from many quarters. Some people have said that UCD is actually not really a theory at all. It's an orienting methodological device. It's not a theory. Others have said, well, if it is a theory, it relates only to modern capitalism and not to history in general. Some have said that it's too structuralist or even Eurocentric. Now, personally, I would happily contest all of these criticisms. But there's one criticism that I think does hold some water. And this is about how the idea of UCD has been applied. If you think about other major uh, theories, like, for example, world systems analysis, that, you know, they've started out with a big picture statement about contemporary world development. And they've then gone on to fill that out with historical and theoretical applications. Now, of course, Trotsky did that big picture statement as well. It was central to the politics of the Bolshevik Revolution. But we no longer live in the conjuncture of 1917. And I think it's striking that the current revival of UCD has not yet quite, I think, produced a version of this. So as some critics have pointed out, nearly all the recent applications have been either abstract arguments about social theory or historical treatments of past events or very localized applications to contemporary processes, uh, mostly in the global south. And I think that criticism is broadly correct. It's much harder to find UCD today being used empirically to picture the overall process of capitalist world development and to explain major events in the core of the world system today. Now recently I've tried to um, contribute to addressing this imbalance by co-authoring an article uh, with a political economist friend of mine, Chris Boyle, on how we might use UCD to understand two of the most dramatic events of recent years, Brexit and Trump. And I'd like to set out that analysis today. It's not the whole of the big picture we need, and we need other rival big pictures as well, but I'm hoping that doing this might lead us into a wider discussion of uneven and combined development in the current conjuncture. I'm gonna set this argument out in four main steps. So I'm gonna start with the underlying premise of uneven and combined development. I think it's really important to clarify exactly what is distinctive about this as an idea. I'll then say how I think it operates as an intellectual method, right? What's involved in applying the theory? Then thirdly, I want to summarize the actual conjunctural analysis that I think arises if we apply UCD to 2016 in this way, and how it therefore explains or connects to an explanation of Brexit and Trump. 
And then finally, I'll say, I think, where this leaves us in terms of the wider project of uneven and combined development today as an intellectual project, intellectual and political, actually. Okay, so let's start at the beginning. For any Marxist, the emergence of capitalism is, of course, the central unfolding event of modern world history. It's constitutive of what modern world history is. But for Trotsky, this was also an event that was both staggered and interactive in space and time. And above all, it was happening in different times in different countries. And yet these different countries were also coexisting and interacting in real time. So it was, in that sense, uneven and combined. And this gave rise to extra empirical causes in modern history, over and above those that could be derived directly from the logic of capitalism or any other mode of production conceived as a singular process. So the best known of these extra causes are what Trotsky called the whip of external necessity and the privilege of historical backwardness. But of course, there are plenty of others as well. For example, the role of substitutionism in late development, the resequencing of historical processes, the amalgamation of different uh, forms of society, and so on. And from all these extra causes, two things follow for historical analysis. First, each national society turns out to have its own peculiarities arising from its unique position in that overall process. And secondly, the global process of capitalist development itself cannot be unilinear. It can't take the form of an expanding repetition of the original emergence of capitalism in Britain or Northwestern Europe. Because the actual historical causes that drive it necessarily come to include the interaction of societies at different levels of development. And it therefore must be a dialectical process. And this claim was, of course, the basic premise of the theory of permanent revolution as well, and therefore for Trotsky's political strategy too. So from this, I think it follows that uneven and combined development has distinctive explanatory and strategic political implications. But the question then, sorry, let's just bring up permanent revolution. I don't want to forget that. The question then is, how do you actually apply it in order to reveal these implications? And I think, the, in, in a way, the answer has, is always staring us in the face because it's contained in the sequence of the three words that make up the term, or the name of the concept itself. Uneven, combined, development. And what I mean by that is that we start by identifying some pattern of unevenness that we think may somehow lie behind the thing that we're trying to understand. Right? We start by asking what is the, the dominant vector of uneven development in the world today, for example, or in the particular region that we're looking at, or even within the particular society that we're looking at. And Trotsky had, a, um, I think, a really good phrase for this when he said, it's all a question of concrete correlations. Meaning, the particular conjunction of differentially developed societies that obtains at a given point in time and that are interacting with each other. That's the content of unevenness. And of course, in Trotsky's original example, the key unevenness was the coexistence of an agrarian absolutist state in Russia with industrial capitalist societies emerging in Northwestern Europe. So that's the first step. The second step is to examine how these different societies combined. Now, in Trotsky's case, the Tsarist state imported loans, factories, weapons, and ideas from outside. That created a new kind of society in which peasant agriculture and a pre-capitalist state were dialectically fused with the latest results of advanced capitalist development from elsewhere. And that new unstable hybrid of the old and the new 
was also now integrated into the overall international structure of capitalist development itself. So combination is both something that happens inside the societies affected and, if you like, to the global shape of capitalist world development. And I think you need to study both of those simultaneously in order to grasp you know, what is meant by the di dialectical logic of process of uneven and combined development. And then finally, we have to ask how the peculiar social structures generated by the interactive combination of societies gives rise to the particular set of developments that we want to understand. How it connects to the, the, the immediate causes of what we're trying to explain. Again, for Trotsky, Russia's combined development blocked a bourgeois revolution there, but it also radicalized the emerging proletariat, and it was his detailed empirical analysis of how the interaction of societies at different levels of development produced these effects, which explained the paradox of 1917, namely a socialist-led revolution in a pre-capitalist country. So here, if you like, to, to put it simply, is the logic of explanation. Unevenness leads to combinations. It's the peculiar empirical nature of these combinations which underlies whatever developments we're trying to understand. And I want to suggest that this logic of explanation may also be key to understanding Brexit and Trump. And in order to make that case, I have to concretize those three steps that I've just set out. And here's broadly how I do it. Or I should say how Chris and I do it in the article that we jointly authored. So in the, in the first step, I'm going to argue that in a way that the dominant vector of uneven development in world historical terms in the current conjuncture has sort of been staring us in the face. Over the last three to four decades, I think there simply is nothing bigger going on in the world than the coexistence on the one hand of advanced neoliberal capitalism in the West with a massive process of primitive accumulation in China. So that's the first step. That's what I think the dominant vector of unevenness in capitalist world development today is. In the second step, I'm going to go on to explore how the interaction or combination of these two worlds transformed both of them and generated an unprecedented trade shock at a moment of maximum openness in the world economy. And then finally, I'm going to try and show how this trade shock intensified a, re a regional pattern of inequality inside both the United Kingdom and the United States. And this regional inequality, amazingly, matches the distribution of the 2016 voting pattern for both Leave in the UK and Trump in the United States. So in effect, I'm saying that the fundamental cause of these events was not capitalist crisis in general, or immigration, or the rise of white supremacism, or even globalization. I think it was something even bigger that underlay all of them, namely, the global configuration of uneven and combined development in the current world historical conjuncture. Okay, so now in order to identify this relevant pattern of unevenness, I want to kind of step back and think about the current conjuncture in world historical terms, because I think this tells us something about what's been going on that I don't think we can see in any other way. In 1853, Marx famously reflected on the role of British imperialism in India. He noted that England's motives were, as he put it, vile and selfish. But he then went on to say, but that is not the question. The question is, he says, can mankind fulfill its destiny without a fundamental revolution in the social state of Asia? Now that may look at first like a classic instance of Victorian Orientalism, 
But I think that buried inside this question is actually a profound intuition about the historical geography of modern world development. If you think about it, in 1853, when Marx was saying this, industrial capitalist society had barely spread beyond England. By the end of the century, it would have spread east into Europe and west to the United States. But even then, and despite having subjected the rest of the world to imperialist domination, it would remain in itself a minority occupation. The largest populations on the planet still lay outside it, where centuries of pre-capitalist world development had concentrated them in continental Asia. And you can still see this legacy in world population maps today, like this one. And I think this is the basic point that Marx is contemplating in this quotation. Capitalism began outside the demographic core of earlier human history. Sooner or later, its expansion would detonate the core itself. And only then would the full significance of industrialization for modern world history begin to unfold. So he's saying, you know, there's going to be a massive gear change in the, uh, in the workings of modern world history when capitalism finally ceases to be uh, a minority occupation and, and breaks up these vast residues of um, peasant existence in Asia. And as I'm sure um, you know from your own reading, what Marx was anticipating is something that is widely recognized in contemporary um, economic writings about the world economy. It's called the big country effect. And the big country effect is, is, is in this case saying that when China industrializes, the fact that it is 27 times the population of South Korea, which was the largest of the newly industrializing countries in East Asia, this fact means that its impact is going to differ not just in degree, but also in kind. And there's no doubt about the huge significance of this big country effect. It meant, for example, that China would become the second largest economy even when its per capita GDP was still ranked 94th in the world, right? fundamentally changing the, the political and, and material balance between developed and developing countries in the world economy. It meant that even in its early stages, China's industrialization could reverse the declining global terms of trade for primary commodities with huge impacts on other societies worldwide. So from export volumes to foreign currency reserves to greenhouse gas emissions, you know, we're all in a way sick and tired of the mind-boggling statistics uh, of Chinese industrialization. They seem to be endless. And I think what that's showing us is that the rise overnight of this enormous new actor, the population equivalent, remember, of 11 new Japans or four new USAs, must fundamentally change the shape of the world economy. And that's even before China is followed by India. So Marx was not wrong to say that Asian industrialization was an earthquake waiting to happen. But of course, as we also know, earthquakes are notoriously difficult to predict. And here Marx was mistaken. Marx thought that this fundamental revolution in the social state of Asia was already underway in India in 1853. But we know that the continental industrialization in Asia eventually took off, not in colonial India, but in post-Maoist China more than a century later. And this created an enormous world historical episode of uneven development because China's industrialization has been so delayed that its big country effects were pent up and carried forward across historical and developmental time. They were then released into a radically different historical environment 
to the one envisaged by Marx. Namely, they were released into the post Bretton Woods world of neoliberalism and an emerging digital revolution. And that was indeed an earthquake, but one with strange effects, because it was as if socio-historical time had been broken up into spatially separate fragments, and these fragments had then been put back together in a different order, so that phenomena that originally belonged in different times had now ended up unpredictedly next to each other. And the result was that both sides of the equation were transformed. The early stages of industrial takeoff in China now intersected with advanced capitalist societies that were, what, 100, 200 years ahead of them. And that meant that both the whip of external necessity and the privilege of historic backwardness were much larger, setting the stage for a much faster takeoff. Meanwhile, the advanced societies on the other side of the equation found themselves coexisting and interacting with a vast new instance of a process of primitive accumulation that they themselves had long left behind, but which was now set in train by China's market reform of agriculture. For them, the result was a sudden access to an enormous reservoir of unbelievably cheap labor power. And that gave multinational corporations the legroom to transform the structure of capitalist production, I think, much faster than they could otherwise have done. I'll go into that in a bit more detail in a moment. But here I just want to make the point that the key historical unevenness was this intersection of primitive accumulation in China with the neoliberal moment in the advanced capitalist countries. Okay, so now let's move on to the second step by asking how these radically different temporalities combined with each other. I'm going to look first at how China's lateness affected its industrial takeoff, and then I'll look at how that takeoff played into the neoliberal transformation of the world economy. As we know, Trotsky argued that historical unevenness produces a privilege of historic backwardness, a privilege that falls to those who come late in the developmental process. One measure of this privilege is the shrinking amount of time it takes for those societies which are successful to achieve the initial quintupling of its per capita GDP due to the industrial takeoff. And what this graph shows is that, among other things, it took Britain over 160 years to achieve that initial quintupling of per capita GDP. It only took 100 for the United States, 75 for Japan, and 25 for the newly, uh, East Asian newly industrial uh, uh, countries. And according to the World Bank, China reached this point in under 20 years. That's an incredible multiplier of the big country effect. It means that the demographic equivalent of the takeoff of four new USAs is also traveling at five times the speed that the United States was doing in the 19th century. So how did this privilege of historic backwardness operate in China's case? There seem to have been four main ways. Foreign learning, technology transfer, export markets, and inward investment. So by foreign learning, I mean partly the role of the World Bank and the Japanese government in giving China macroeconomic expertise on how to introduce market mechanisms in a way that drew on the uh, accumulated experience of the East Asian developmental pattern. I also mean the sending of four million Chinese students to study at foreign universities by 2015. I mean the role of the overseas Chinese communities in providing managerial skills and trading networks that made up for the lack of market institutions and culture inside China. 
In all these ways, by substituting foreign expertise, China was able to move much more quickly than its existing educational infrastructure would have allowed. Secondly, China's late development also meant that it could make huge productivity leaps by importing advanced technology and combining it with the low wage levels that characterize the primitive accumulation phase of capitalist development. And China was also, of course, able to use access to its huge domestic market as a bargaining chip to force foreign companies to engage in joint ventures. <coughs> as a result, China achieved a massive transfer of technology. And the combination of advanced technology with incredibly low labor costs underpinned what came to be uh, described as the three most terrifying words to any Western businessman, the China price, the China price, which not only made China so attractive for multinationals to offshore their production processes too, but it also made China's exports super competitive in foreign markets. Then thirdly, the very existence of those foreign markets, especially the, the really rich, highly developed ones in North America and Europe, was also a privilege of backwardness produced by the historical unevenness of capitalist world development. And its importance in enabling superfast development in this period can be seen in the fact that in 2006, China's exports to GDP ratio was running at 37%, which is unprecedented for a country of that size. And then finally, China also enjoyed a privilege of historic backwardness through the existence of huge amounts of capital that had already accumulated abroad and which now supercharged its development through foreign investment. And by 2016, uh, this amounted to $1.7 trillion of uh, FDI, most of it contributing directly to China's leading export sectors. So in all these ways, the rise of China has been accelerated by its belatedness, that is, by the historical unevenness of capitalist world development. But what about the other side of the concrete correlation, the impact of China's rise on the world economy? I think that if we step back and try to picture the process as a whole, we can see that the impact of China's rise includes three fundamental aspects. First, a change in the, in the balance or shape of the world economy through the transfer of industrial production from north to south. Secondly, a change in the texture of the world economy due to the rise of global value chains produced by offshoring uh, and outsourcing. And thirdly, a huge export surge arising from China's central role in both of these previous changes. Now, in a minute, we'll see how these trade shocks uh, resulting from this surge of exports played into the politics of Brexit and Trump. But first, let me just fill in these wider changes in the world economy. So between 1990 and 2005, in 15 years, the Global South's share of world manufacturing value sorry, manufacturing value added, more than doubled, from under 15% to just over 30%. But most of this increase was China. China accounted for 59% of the Global South's increased share in manufacturing value added, and nearly two-thirds of its increased share of global merchandise exports. In fact, over the first decade of this 21st century, China accounted for two-thirds of the Global South's entire processing trade, becoming, in effect, a kind of funnel through which passed the greater part of East Asia's exports of manufactured goods to the West and elsewhere. But China's rise affected not just the shape, but also the texture of the world economy. It accelerated the spread of global commodity chains in which production processes owned by northern multinationals 
were broken down and partly offshored so as to take advantage of cheap labour in the Global South, the global labour arbitrage. At the end of the 20th century, the size of the global labour market doubled, and half of that increase was produced by the process of primitive accumulation in China. And because the offshoring produced exports that then competed directly with domestic manufacturers in the United States and Britain and Europe, they also increased the pressure for more and more producers to modularize and partly outsource their manufacturing. Now the result of the changing balance and texture of the world economy was an enormous surge of Chinese exports, nominally Chinese exports, because of course large uh, portions of them, especially in the leading sectors, were in fact being exported by foreign multinationals that were um, uh, outsour um, offshoring uh, parts of their production processes. So within a decade of its World Trade Organization accession in 2001, Chinese exports rose from 250 billion per year to 2 trillion, making China suddenly the largest trading country on the planet. And that surge had two unique characteristics, both of them resulting from the fact that China's takeoff coincided with the neoliberal deregulation of the international economy. First, instead of industrializing behind high levels of protectionism, as the East Asian NICs had done, China inserted itself into the production processes of foreign multinationals. And that meant that its manufacturing export surge came suddenly at the beginning of the process rather than later on, after it had developed an integrated national economy in the sequence that had happened in the case of Japan and then later the uh, newly industrializing countries. And of course also, because China had inserted itself into the production processes of foreign multinationals, the exports competed directly with high-tech producers that were still manufacturing in the advanced economies. And then secondly, this same coinciding of this export surge with neoliberalism in the West also meant that the surge happened just when Western markets were at a point of maximum openness. So the net result was a uniquely large and wide export surge that was unprecedentedly sudden, impacting on markets that were unusually open. It's no wonder they called it the China shock. But how does that explain Brexit and Trump? Well, in our article, we argue that the answer has three parts to it. First, in both the United States and Britain, Chinese imports hit manufacturing jobs particularly hard. And that produced a hollowing out of the employment structures that led to widening income inequality. Secondly, that inequality was then intensified by the financial crisis, and particularly by the regionally skewed shape of the eventual recovery. Jobs came back, but not manufacturing jobs, so the hollowing out was not reversed. And finally, in both countries, the United States and Britain, voters were eventually given a choice in a national poll between a status quo option backed by the establishment and a populist option based on rejecting control or exploitation by foreigners. In both cases, the anti-establishment vote was consistently stronger in regions where jobs had been most exposed to import competition. Sorry, can you, can you now, you, at least for me, you're, you're fading. Could you okay. yeah, All right. speak a little louder and go back one sentence? I'll go back one sentence, okay. Um, in both cases, the anti-establishment vote was consistently stronger in regions where jobs had been most exposed to import competition from China. In fact, and I think this is the key point, it turns out that this uneven regional exposure is a stronger predictor of how regions voted 
than any of the other causes that have been invoked. So let me uh, try and give you some of the evidence for this argument. First, in the seven years leading up to the financial crisis, there was what I think we have to describe as a frenzy of outsourcing to China. In those seven years alone, the number of US manufacturing jobs fell by 20%, and in Britain it was 25%. Actual manufacturing output didn't fall, but it became more concentrated in high-skilled sectors. As a result of this hollowing out, inequality of earnings between more and less educated workers deepened. Now, to some extent, cheap Chinese imports softened the impact of this. But at the same time, low interest rates, supported by China's policy of dollar recycling, also meant that US house prices and debt-financed consumption ran even further ahead of growth in employment and income than they would otherwise have done. And in this way, China's rise also meant that the financial crash, when it came in 2007, 2008, was even bigger than it would otherwise have been. That's the first point. Secondly, although by 2016, China's growth rate had halved to 7% following the contraction uh, produced by the Great Recession, China's export volumes more than recovered from the crash, reaching a record 21.5% of US imports by 2015. What was that figure? 21.5% of all US imports uh, by 2015. That kept up the pressure on US and British manufacturing employment so that when the recovery came, most of the millions of jobs lost in 2008 to 9 did not come back. And that meant that the recovery as a whole was highly skewed regionally. Metropolitan regions like London and the Southeast or the New York and Los Angeles corridors benefited from strong employment growth in services. But manufacturing-based non-metro areas in both countries did not recover. And in Britain, these areas would also be hardest hit by the austerity cuts to local government funding imposed from 2010 onwards. So given this regionally skewed recovery, I think it's not surprising that these so-called non-metro regions in both countries formed the epicenter of a deepening uh, polit uh, polarization of national politics. Even before 2016, David O'Tor's research in the United States was showing a correlation, and these were studies that he did of Tea Party uh, voters, a correlation between exposure to import competition from China and electoral support for more radical candidates uh, on both left and right, anti-free trade candidates. And in Britain, the rise of UKIP, the, uh, the UK Independence Party, was driven largely by votes from similarly affected regions. And then finally, the regional unevenness of the recovery added a cultural and even ethnic and racial dimension to the political polarization, because in both countries, the recovery was strongest in the more multicultural metropolitan regions. And when viewed from the largely white provincial backwaters, this supported the idea of an alliance between liberal cosmopolitan elites and entitled ethnic minorities. So in both countries, a mainly economic contrast had the potential to spill over into a much wider cultural and ethnic and even racial opposition. And this brings us thirdly to the Brexit and Trump votes themselves. In the Brexit debate, if I was listening correctly, there was hardly any mention of the China trade shocks. I don't remember any discussion of that. 
Instead, in my recollection, the focus was on these two key issues. A general call to take back control from the EU and specific fears about immigration. And these made it look like what produced the result was a combination of deep-seated Euroscepticism with anxiety about immigration. And that's still, I think, the dominant mainstream narrative today about what caused uh, Brexit, the Brexit vote. But is it actually the case? In April 2017, The Economist published this digest of Ipsos Mori polls. And what it shows is that in the decade before the referendum, the percentage of Britons who agreed that the EU is one of the most important issues facing the country had barely risen above 10%, before suddenly leaping to 40% during the referendum debate. Now, actually, I think this graph repays closer uh, analysis because what it seems to show is that there was a low in the numbers of people feeling that the EU was a burning issue in 2010, just before austerity cuts were introduced. Those cuts are then followed by a rise in the numbers here, which corresponds in time to the rise of UKIP support, which rose to between 12 and 14%. But at the point where the Conservative Party panicked and promised a referendum, it's still less than 15%. So this makes it look like the wider obsession with the EU comes with the referendum, apparently as its result and not as its cause. And that already suggests that anti-EU sentiment functioned somehow as a proxy for something else. And the same seems to apply to immigration. As we know, the Leave vote was highly regionalized, varying from 21.4% to 72.3% in different places. But this variation does not correlate with areas of significant immigration. This graph on the right plots the distribution, the geographical uh, distribution of the leave, sorry, the, the, dist- the distribution of the strength of the leave vote against the geography of immigration uh, communities in the UK. So if there was a positive correlation, the angled line would be pointing upwards towards the top right-hand corner. In fact, however, it's pointing down, which indicates a negative correlation, not even no correlation at all, a negative correlation. And in an Ipsos Mori poll conducted last year in 27 countries, Britain turned out to be the most positive of all countries surveyed about immigration, with 48% saying that immigration has a positive impact on their society. I think only 28% or something saying that it had a negative impact, which is twice the global average in that survey. And if you go to the, um, the website where that um, Ipsos Mori poll is um, displayed, you can also dig down into their longitudinal surveys, which show that over time, certainly since 2011, uh, anxiety about immigration has been reducing year on year and appears to be completely unaffected by the um, by the referendum debate itself. So what on earth is going on? If, EU and anti, an, if anti-EU and anti-immigration feeling did not produce the referendum and its result, what did? Well, I think part of the answer is that there is one variable that consistently tracks the differing strength of the Leave vote in different parts of the country. And that variable is the extent to which employment in different regions was exposed to the China shocks from 1990 up until um, the the financial crisis in 2007. 
In a detailed uh, study of this published last year in the uh, American Political Science Review, two Italian scholars demonstrated this correlation. And they calculated that if all the UK regions had been exposed to Chinese imports only as much as those at the first quartile of the range, then this would have reversed the referendum result. And of course, if the rise of China or its equivalent had not occurred, then the Leave vote would have been much lower again. And what's most remarkable about their study is that regional vulnerability to the China shocks is even a better predictor of levels of anxiety about immigration than is the regional distribution of immigration itself. So once again, the apparent cause turns out to be operating as a proxy for something else. Now, oh, is it working again? Okay, thanks. Now this model used by um, those two scholars, uh, Colin Tony and Stanig, was actually taken from the work of David O'Tour that I mentioned a minute ago and his colleagues in the United States who had been studying the electoral effect of the China shock on support for anti-free trade candidates in US politics. In the presidential primaries in 2016, as we all know, Bernie Sanders drew very strong support from this same demographic, namely from regions whose employment had suffered uh, particularly strongly from Chinese imports. But as we also know, when Hillary Clinton received the Democratic nomination, those voters no longer had an anti-status quo candidate from the left, and enough of them turned to Donald Trump to hand him victory in the Electoral College. In fact, O'Tour and his colleagues calculate that if the China shock had been only half its actual size, Clinton would have won the presidency. Immediately after this, in 2016, the Wall Street Journal ruefully concluded that the rise of China had, and I quote, rattled the American economy more violently than economists and policymakers anticipated at the time or realized for years later, end of quote. And I think the voting analysis that I've been citing potentially provides the last link in a chain of reasoning which, if it's right, shows how that rattling fed through to the electoral successes of Brexit and Trump. So let me end uh, by briefly clarifying the argument. Of course, like all historical events, Brexit and Trump had multiple causes. So it must seem implausible to attribute them to a single cause like the rise of China. And in response, I think I would say three things. First, there's the sheer scale of this rise as a historical process. It's at least as big as the rise of the United States in the 19th century. In fact, by some measures, it's four times the size, moving at five times the speed. So I think what is really implausible is that a process of such magnitude could occur without having enormous effects. Even if it's complicated to uh, reconstruct how those effects fed through into the things we're trying to explain, the idea that this would happen and, as it were, the world remained unchanged, that there wouldn't be political turbulence, I think is, is implausible. But secondly, the argument actually is not about China's takeoff alone. It's about how uneven and combined development produced this concrete correlation of primitive accumulation in China with neoliberalism elsewhere. Two social processes that intersected in real time even though they came from opposite ends of the history of capitalist development. It was that enormous instance of spatio-temporal unevenness that both sides, China and Western corporations, leveraged to produce the China shocks. Without it, China's takeoff would have been slower and neoliberalism could not have outsourced so much so quickly. So I'm saying that the concrete 
correlation was a crucial multiplier on both sides of this uh, process. And then finally, I suspect that even the things that one might think provide an alternative explanation are not really the completely independent causes they might appear. For example, financialization and the financial crisis were built on years of easy credit, assisted in some part by China's dollar recycling. Automation also produces job losses, but automation also can itself be a response to import competition. Immigration fears were at least partly a dependent variable of the China shocks, and even globalization, which in the conventional narrative created the left-behind populations that largely voted for Brexit and Trump, can be seen in retrospect, globalization, I think, to be something of a misnomer. As we saw earlier on, the sheer weight of China in the southward shift of global industry and trade suggests that terms like the BRICS, the rise of the rest, and maybe even globalization itself have turned out to be quite misleading. And I think what all this points to is that Brexit and Trump are the outcome of a unique conjuncture a, a one-off, it could only happen once, in the history of uneven and combined development. If so, then uneven and combined development is not simply able to be applied to contemporary world affairs. It is arguably the approach that most helps us to understand the current moment and how we arrived here. And I'd like to end on one final brief point. I said at the start of of my talk, that UCD needs a distinctive analysis of the current conjuncture. I hope I've shown that Trotsky's idea certainly can produce that, even if your own version uh, would differ from mine. But of course, for Trotsky, this was only half the task. The other half was form formulating a different political strategy. In the end, Trotsky's political vision failed. Permanent revolution led not to world socialism, but to the nightmare of Stalinism. But I think that only intensifies the challenge that now faces us. If the original template of permanent revolution has fallen away, what is the politics of uneven and combined development in the current conjuncture? This conjuncture provides even more evidence of the enormous significance of international unevenness. How do we incorporate that international dimension into our conception of political agency and transformation? I don't know the answer to that. One approach, a broadly intersectionalist one, has been provided by Alex and Kerem in their book on uh, how the West came to rule in the last chapter. But I think we need many approaches, because only when we have that as a many-sided political debate will we have recovered the full potential of Trotsky's idea, which is not just an abstract theoretical schema or a tool of historical and contemporary analysis, but also an enabler of political agency. 25 years into the revival of UCD, I think that is now the last big piece of the jigsaw that we need in order to complete the picture. And when we look at the turmoil that Brexit and Trump have brought in their wake, it's surely also the most urgent task facing us today. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. We've already gone into the break. Um, I, I don't know if there's any organizer here that can tell us how far we can. I, we're supposed to end the break at 12. Uh, so let's just start taking questions, all right? Uh, start here. Okay, well, the first thing is the tank of America comes because it's engaged in this uh, trade war now with China. So, in terms of what you said, there is a sort of objective basis for what you're saying because he's firing at a target which is having a real impact on America. But in this country, we, it appears to be, is it that we are, it's all completely false 
consciousness that started being in Europe, but in fact it should be China. Is there a China problem here that we haven't spotted in the way that Trump is doing? In other words, we, if we're all going about China, it makes sense, but that's not what's happening here. I mean, is it purely false consciousness? Or is it that we know they spotted the China impact on the northern cities? And, and, and the second question was that the other part of this but the other part of the story which we need to think about is not just the right-wing reaction to uneven development, but also the revolutionary, i.e. democratic revolutionary element of this. And could the uneven development in the UK be the um, bringing about some sort of democratic revolutionary change that we haven't quite spotted yet either? That's yeah. another kind of left response to the situation. In which case, <laughs> it's like the question of Scotland and Ireland,
not simply the pressure of, of, the, uh, of the world of uh, you know, world opportunity and need to respond as a framework of uh, I even mean, combined development. So I think you can lose that because if you frame it this way, sooner or later, especially if you're referring to an event that has happened, well, it must have happened. But for the longest time, it's a question, and for, I believe for this thing you're posing, the question is how come you got the rise of capitalism in China in the late 80s and, and 90s? So that's point one. Second point is I, I think, uh, well, I, uh, you know, I think that extremely important, the, you can't really overestimate the weight of China, uh, as, as you say, and, and it has opened the way for really interesting work, political work, like culture, and so forth. But if you end up focusing on this one aspect, I mean, one aspect, and you'll see what I mean by aspect of what? Well, the aspect of the developing a world of overcapacity in manufacturing, which begins in the 1960s and leads to a, a, a continual downward uh, pressure on the world economy and profits, and then the response to profits, uh, investment, uh, wages, government spending, demand, slowdown, and that is a, pro a deepening process that you can see starting in the uh, 1960s and, and 70s. And it goes from Germany to Japan to the, the Knicks to Southeast Asia to the big one, to China. But uh, that development has been going on all through the period. And what has been happening parallel to that is the rise of the right Starting in the 1970s and, and, and even a little bit earlier, you begin to get a shift in the American working class right away because of the, the kind of mechanisms you're referring to with, with China and the size of China. No doubt, I mean, it would be stupid not to see that. But it's also, I think, a, a huge mistake uh, to what, what this story ends up to be is a story of international competition. But the story is not international competition. It's capitalist, the, uh, capitalist, the mechanisms of capitalist crisis, which meant for, uh, which meant uh, a, the developments that you're talking about are just the tail end, both in terms of political economy and politics of developments that go back to the, you know, to the late 60s and 70s, and especially Living in the United States, we've watched the work of Best of Right for, for in that time. Justin, do you mind if I take three more? I know it's quite a bit. I think you should actually and just go on taking more. <laughs> <laughs> two, uh, two things. Trotsky's uh, uneven and combined. Trotsky's theory of uneven and combined uh, development is not a theory of uneven and combined capitalist development. What's uneven and what's being combined are capitalist and non-capitalist societies. Number one. So as originally formulated, uh, what uh, his theory, his, uh, his theory uh, is really not applicable to, if you presume, capitalist development throughout Number two, using uh, Russia as his example, Trotsky says, well, you have two kinds of society. One, modern, capitalist, industrial development in the cities. In agriculture, you have backward feudal relations. Okay. And so you have this combination. Well, uh, the thing that must be asked is, just because Trotsky says so doesn't make it so. I have to tell, I have to say, that uh, historians who are experts in Russian history 
would never consider America and uh, the Russian industry to be at the cutting edge of technological development. On the contrary, it's very backward. This is an empirical question. There can be no doubt about this. And the problem, of course, is that unfortunately, just too many Marxists take what Trotsky says about Russia to be the gospel truth. And many of them, uh, you know, basically have uh, a hard time challenging that very premise, which I'll challenge this afternoon. Um, thanks for what I found um, fascinating and actually very instructive talk in the way for me, the way you delivered it. I think it was very clear and understandable. And you're right that Mark's voice is kind of wrong, but I think the events you described vindicated them. Um, and what I want to talk about was like, in the, it's only really in the last decade that Marx's proletariat, which is a tiny proportion of the globe, when he wrote the Communist Manifesto, is in fact now the dominant force in the world, numerically. Um, the great figure that Marx talked about is with us, the world working class. It's sad what's happening to the British working class, but we can raise our eyes. Not just China, but India, what's happening there as well. But there begins a mass strike movement. begins a militant working class organisation, which is something I think we have to be optimistic about. So I wonder if you would see a bit more about that, because I think the most important thing, and I think it indicates Trotsky as well, the most important thing about the things that you've talked about, the rapid, fantastic developments that take place with the China shock, as you describe it. It's what about the great figure in China? What can you tell us about that? Sorry, last sentence again. What can you tell us about the great figure in China? It's in fact. Yeah, okay. Um, I thought it was a great presentation, although I qualified publication about your conclusion. Firstly, just to put in response to what Bob Brennan just said, I do want to emphasize, I think, the significance of US capital offshoring, outsourcing, in response to the crisis of profitability that certainly was there in the 1970s, is something actually you've not taken fully on board. There's been far more restructuring and exit than your work, I think, acknowledged. Far more, and far more restructuring on the part of US capital, yeah? and indeed British capital, than your work has acknowledged in the past. And I think China is a huge part of that, but we should also not underestimate the degree to which there is now capital service being generated from within China itself. And now what we're seeing, and maybe Justin Lauren, if you want that, Justin's nodding, so he can expand on that point and the implications of it. My qualification is brief concerns the analysis of Brexit, uh, the people voting for Brexit. The uh, correlation might well be positive with uh, the voting areas and the impact of the China shock, but the scatter of the points on the graph indicates it's a weak correlation. Um, and it's important to recognise that, I think this is also true in the states of Trump, though. There is also a very large, if you like, sort of ageing, petty bourgeois layer in the Tory uh, heartlands of Britain who weren't, who were voting for Brexit, alongside that layer of working class uh, uh, disorganised workers, I think is how I would characterise them, uh, in large parts of the sort of run down uh, North. Um, and I think that we, we shouldn't be over reductions about that analysis. Thank you. All right, I've got three more in the back. Uh, I know you we have one in the back. Thank you very much. Um, a few people have touched on my question so far, and that is that when you talk about these two things happening, you've got capitalism in China and neoliberalism in the advanced Western economies. You say it's. Um, Two different phenomena that belong in different times and end up unpredictably next to each other. It sort of speaks to these are just kind of random or abstract things that cropped up simultaneously, as opposed to what a few people have mentioned, which is that you have got in the 60s and 70s an overaccumulation of capital in the West that needs to be invested somewhere more profitably. And um, so that actually playing into um, capitalism in China. And equally, from these opportunities of capitalism in China, 
as opposed to neoliberalism just having existed at the same time, um, how those opportunities helped to drive a lot of um, how neoliberalism was comprised in terms of those opportunities for Western capital, pushing for free trade, pushing for free trade agreements uh, over the decades that really um, consolidated neoliberalism. So really, is it less that you had these two things happen at the same time, uh, these two phenomena, rather than these things formed a kind of more of a dialectic that influenced one another at the same time? One, one uh, small point and then a large point. Um, a very convincing, but a, a first of all, permanent revolution said that, that, I mean, Trotsky said Russia will only succeed in building a social state if there was an international revolution. It didn't happen. Yeah. So I don't think you can blame the theory. I think you can blame the faith to have an international revolution. Um, on, the, on the question of Brexit and Trump, you're talking about the voting for these, you know, for these things, but you also need to see, for example, on Brexit, that the, the split in the Tory party, which you see now, a big chunk being kicked out, goes back decades. And it's to do with the position of Britain and British imperialism between America, you know, which, which of the powerful forces after the Second World War, Britain is no longer the imperial power. And I suspect there are issues about that in terms of the American ruling class. You have to see both of these things as ruling class ideology imposing itself on, on the working class in many ways. So I agree with a lot of the, the effects that you're talking about, but I don't think you can take it that far. You can explain what some of the voting plans, and doesn't explain Brexit, nor American imperialism. Two final questions, please, uh, this one. Yeah, uh, actually, the point I was going to make was connected with the point that uh, Greg Johnny just made. Um, I think it's a, there's a coincidence of timing here. It's that, that question which I was actually going to ask you, and it is a question. And if I understand you correctly, what you're saying is the rise of China is actually uh, led to the hollowing out of uh, you know, deindustrialization uh, in uh, Britain and also in the US. And these are the areas uh, which vote for Trump and also vote for Brexit respectively. But actually, deindustrialization, we're speaking about it particularly in a British context and in the Scottish context, predates uh, the rise of China in the late 80s and uh, early 90s. And the fundamental impact of uh, the substantial impact of the industrialization has been felt long before uh, the uh, 1990s in this area. I mean, for instance, the famous uh, Timex dispute in Dundee, which really basically brings, draws a line under uh, you know, that old style of industrialization in uh, Dundee, actually happens in the early 90s. Uh, so there is a question there I would, I'd like to ask you, isn't it just a quick question that actually it's not connected with uh, China? There is a coincidence because it is these areas uh, which were deindustrialized in the 80s as a result of Thatcherite revolution, the move towards neoliberalism, that saw import substitution and saw Chinese uh, imports coming in. And that includes obviously areas like the North of England and also Scotland, but Scotland bucks the trend in that regard as well. Over two thirds of people actually voted uh, against uh, Brexit in Scotland. That would also be the case. Suspect in Northern Ireland as well, where you've seen a port substitution there, but there's also been a move towards uh, voting for uh, staying within the EU. So, although I think there's, it's, you know, I'm very interested in your thesis and I'd like to look at it in a little bit more detail, I would ask you these questions and say, but does this actually cut across uh, what you're actually saying? It doesn't just actually point to co uh, coincidence, you know, coincidence both in time. Uh, time and and in that geographical location. Yeah, I'm from Nigeria. I have a question that I want to answer. Uh, can we have something like a commerce capitalism? Commerce capitalism. Commerce capitalism. Yes, and then if we have, can we use it to explain the kind of uh, capitalism in Africa, especially in Nigeria? You know, commerce capitalism. <laughs> um, well, <laughs> my intention was to get a discussion going, and I, I think I've succeeded. Um, so I, you know, obviously I can't respond to all of these points now. I think these are a lot of really great points, and thank you for. Um, I've made copious notes, and 
they'll really help me to, to think things through. I think probably the best way to respond is, is not to take them serially, but to try and say something in response to what I think is the, the sort of gathering logic of, of the response in terms of people's feelings about what's missing or problematic in, in the argument that I've put forward. And I think one of, the, one of the main points is that I've made it look as if this was some kind of wild historical coincidence that sort of came out of nowhere. I mean, you were saying that surely there's a prehistory to this, and surely you would need to um, you know, build in that prehistory um, in, you know, as part of the, of the explanation, and I completely agree with that. In fact, in the article, we, and this also relates to Bob's point about there's a prehistory in China, which would have to explain why it was at this moment in uh, 1978 that the um, reform process begins. So in, in the article version of this, which I'm afraid is 15,000 words, we have a whole section on what the earlier conjunctures of uneven and combined development were, basically leading from the start of the 20th century, that led to this particular concatenation. Now, that of course is, you know, the whole question about is it coincidental? Well, I would say that there is nothing coincidental about the fact that capitalist world development will continually throw up conjunctions of advanced and emerging processes of, of capitalist development. So this phenomenon of combined development is an intrinsic, in a sense it's endogenous to the nature of capitalist world development. That's where I would, would uh, respectfully disagree with Bob's approach, where I see Bob's approach as it were working outwards from individual societies rather than, as it were, trying to get an, an overview of what the global state of uneven and combined development is in a given historical conjuncture. Now this particular conjunction of um, Chinese industrialization with a much, much more advanced capitalist world economy outside is one that was always coming. Right? Sooner or later, unless, capital, unless the world is, unless either there's a socialist revolution or capitalism collapses into barbarism, I don't know, or, or something else, if what we're living through is a global process of gradual, staggered, but interactive capitalist world development, then at some point, China, if it survived as a nation state, was going to take off industrially, and that was going to be in a context of much more advanced capitalist states around it. So in that sense, there's nothing coincidental about it at all. And the fact that that happened to coincide with the opening of the well, the neoliberal opening of the, the world economy after the breakup of uh, Bretton Woods and so on, is, I think, exactly as you put it. Uh, sorry, I don't know your name at, at the back when you said that they were feeding off each other. And that's exactly my argument, or our argument, that there was a, dialect, there's a dialectical process of, of change that arises out of the particular concrete correlations that the global process of uneven and combined development throws up at any given point. So all the points that people were making about the need to root this argument in an understanding of its historical antecedents, like, for example, that uh, deindustrialization uh, you know, in Britain and, and the US, to some extent, you know, long antecedes the rise of China. Absolutely. And of course, the, the previous big climax of it comes with the rise of the newly industrializing uh, countries in the 70s and 80s. And there, were, you know, there was a previous uh, wave before that, but that once again speaks to the significance of the coexistence in real time of advanced capitalist economies with processes of primitive accumulation elsewhere. So I think, you know, in a sense, the only thing that is new in the current situation is that the particular players involved are that much more f further down the road of capitalist uh, material and, and technological development on the one side, and so much bigger than any previous late developers on the other. But the, the fundamental um, you know, texture of modern world history as being uneven and combined, 
and that you have to get into the detail of, of what that contingently produces in different historical conjunctures, I think is, it's true for this period, and it's true actually you know, for the whole history of, of capitalist world development. So I would say that there is contingency, but there is not, there's nothing random about, the, the, about that qualitative texture of the history of, of modern world development. And I would, I would like to just end by, um, what, maybe I should try and get on to the false consciousness question, because that's a really interesting one. But let, before I do that, I want to say something to Bob, um, who, I mean, you said this last night in your talk, and you said it again today, that if this thing is a law, then it should be happening everywhere, all the time. Okay, I'd, all right. My, well, let me put it the other way. I, I don't think Trotsky says anywhere that just because a society is subjected to a whip of external necessity under conditions of a privilege of historic backwardness, that it will therefore succeed. He did. No, but then, uh, where, where does he say that? I've never seen I mean, for the record, um, I follow the approach taken by Baruch Kne Paz in his book, the 1976 book, uh, The Social and Political Thought of Leon Trotsky, where he says, beyond a certain point, it kind of doesn't matter what Trotsky thought, because you can take this idea of a law of uneven and combined development as a descriptive generalization, and it will still do enormous work as a historical heuristic, right? There is no case of capitalist development occurring in complete isolation from other societies at different levels of development. And the real force, I think, of Trotsky's argument is not in saying that this will pr always produce outcome X, you know, there is some covering law here. No, the point is that it will never produce the unilinear sort of vision of capitalist development that communist parties at, at his time in the Second International were sort of tied to, and that his political opponents in, in Russia were tied to. And I think as a, as a sociological generalization, personally I think it applies to the whole of human history, it is actually sociologically significant that human history has never been unitary. It's always been distributed across multiple social entities, and the inter interactive consequences of that have never been properly incorporated into the modern social sciences. And there, there is, I think, a huge pent-up intellectual potential in Trotsky's idea for, uh, for finally accomplishing that, you know, getting to grips with the, with the international dimension of capitalist world development. So, yes, Bob, I, you know, I'm, I'm sure we could go back and forth on, on what Trotsky says, and maybe this is the point for me also to step away and say um, I'm not actually tied to Trotsky in, in, in that way. 
Are we running out of time? Okay. I, I'm sorry. Let's talk about it over tea, because I think it was... <laughs> <laughs> okay.